Next, we've got to talk about James Webb Space Telescope. So, uh, for those who are brand new, James Webb Space Telescope is the successor of the Hubble Space Telescope. And the big advantage of James Webb Space Telescope is that it was designed to look as far back into the existence of, of light in the universe. The very first galaxies that for, formed, the very first moments of light accumulating after the universe had the Big Bang and expanded into nothingness and darkness and then as proto-matter and things started to assemble themselves in the nothingness of space, uh, what did those first galaxies look like? What did those first stars look like? How did how did things form? We know after, we know before, we've got some data for that, but we don't actually know how things evolved. So that's how far back James Webb Space Telescope will, will be able to look. And it'll also be able to dive deeper, uh, metaphorically, into exoplanets and to observe with even uh, higher precision and with much better, I guess, eyes as to whether any of these exoplanets host life or if we can see any kind of signs of life. Um, we'll be able to get a much better picture of what these planets are. So it, James Webb Space Telescope allows us to do so much. And a big part of what James Webb Space Telescope, how that's able to do that is because it's able, and what they've been working on right now, is getting James Webb Space Telescope, especially the MIRI instrument that they have on board, to cryo-cool temperatures. Uh, so about as cold as matter can get, as, as much as our, our human capability is to do that, um, recently, James Webb Space Telescope is achieving that currently. So uh, the team went on to Twitter and did a Twitter Spaces, and they, they gave kind of a quick update of what's going on. They had scientists, they had engineers on the mission, and they were helping to explain where everything is and answering questions. And I actually had the chance to ask a question that was really cool. I just requested it, and I'm just sitting there in, in the AG3D lab working on some 3D printing stuff. And I was like, oh, this is great. Uh, let me request it. And then, boom, I'm on, and that's literally what we're going to play for you right now. Audience question. Um, Alex G. Orfanos or El Greco, uh, let's see if we can bring you up to ask a question. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the question. Um, Alex from uh, Today in Space podcast. I was... Um, you guys got me thinking about the the, the cooling system, and I, I, it's kind of a multifaceted question. Um, first of all, are there any systems implemented that help regulate the thermal control once you guys get it that cold? And are there any uh, observations that might be heat heavy that you might need to take a break to cool back down afterwards? Thank you. Ah, thank you so much for that question. Um, Constantine, do you want to start off? Sure. Um, the answer is uh, yes. We are counting on uh, on some events where we do have uh, higher heat dissipation in the instrument, and there will be some. Uh, and uh, and perhaps Macarena can describe some of those, uh, some annuals that uh, that will be uh, will be performed periodically. Uh, but uh, um, the the uh, cryo cooler does indeed uh, control its temperature. Um, it's done actually quite efficiently uh, in in our case. Uh, um, there are there are a couple of ways to do that. One is uh, to modulate uh, the amount of cooling that the that the cryo cooler produces. The other one is uh, to do make up heat to have some heaters uh, at the place where. Uh, where you have either uh, detectors or, or instrument. And actually, uh, MIRI system overall uh, uses both of those. Uh, so on the cryocooler side, uh, we modulate uh, our, how much cooling we are producing so that, that at the interface with the instrument, we maintain the temperature. And then internally within the MIRI uh, instrument detectors uh, or uh, detector arrays, uh, uh, there are some additional heaters there that make up heat uh, for variation that is happening on shorter time scales. But yes, uh, we we are certainly temperature controlling, and I, I, it's uh, it's quite important. Uh, and uh, and with that, I think Macarena can uh, can describe a little bit more on on anneals. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Constantine. So anneals um, annealing is a process where of heating up the detector. So essentially, when MIRI is doing cycle one observations and observations to the sky, it will go constantly will be looking at the sky and receiving photons. So those photons uh, will potentially leave latency or persistence that is like 
ghost images, if you will, of what was there uh, before. So one way of getting eliminate all those residuals is actually to heat up the detectors to about 20 plus, almost 30 K, so significantly hotter than they are normally. And that process sort of cleans them up and then they are slowly bring back to cool down and, and they come back to their operating temperature below 7K. And after that process, uh, they really, at least what we've seen in the laboratory, we had to, to test all these things, of course, they really are clean and ready to take observations. And it's a process that takes, for the three detectors, about half an hour. So we will have to decide when to do it and how to do it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, powerful in the sense that it really leaves the detectors ready to take uh, clean science. So I just have to thank NASA for, for doing that. I thought that was really cool. That was my first time really engaging with something like that. And I'm going to try and do it more, uh, especially if that means we could put it up as content here later. The beautiful thing about the public public domain nature of, of NASA. So back to Miri. So so let's, let's talk a little bit about Miri real quick. I'm going to read from the jwst.nasa.gov page about this instrument. So Miri is one of the instruments on board, and it'll observe the red shifted light of distant galaxies, newly forming stars, and faintly visible comets, as well as objects in the Kuiper belt, out, uh, Kuiper belt, out in the third zone of the solar system, um, the deep dark third zone, uh, where Pluto and other um, orbiting bodies from you know the the debris left over from the initial creation of the solar system and possibly in Pluto's case, planets that get scooped up into our gravitational well end up out there. Um, regardless, Miri is going to be able to allow us to observe uh, many things where visible light is very, very difficult uh, to capture. Um, so the mid-infrared instrument uh, Miri has both a camera and a spectrograph that sees light in the mid infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum with wavelengths that are no longer than our eyes see. Uh, Miri covers the wavelength range of 5 to 28 microns, and its sensitive detectors will allow it to see the redshifted light of galaxies. Um, as we just said, <laughs> it'll provide a wide field broadband. Uh, broadband imaging that will continue the breathtaking astrophotography that has made Hubble so universally admired. The spectrograph will enable medium resolution spectroscopy, providing new physical details of the distant objects it will observe. So um, we've there's a lot of info. We'll add this article there, but thank you again, NASA team, uh, both Constantine and Macarena for for adding on to that and. Um, I, I, I love asking questions to smart people, <laughs> especially the NASA folks. Um, they're always they're always willing to answer. So uh, as best they can, right? I um, mean, I thought it was really cool that you know, as James Webb Space Telescope gets used, we're kind of leaving like an imprint after everything that we look at. And so, since it's so cold, the heat from that light is like leaving a mark. So the best way to do that, and my thought, my first thought was, do you have to cool that? Um, but it's actually heating that that actually evens out the image. So I thought that was really cool. I was like, oh, okay, like the heat problem is is very de very something you can deal with with the observation. So it's it, it seems like the challenge really is getting this spacecraft to the temperature, and at that point, it's a lot easier to manage. So it's done all the hard work at this point. James Webb Space Telescope getting assembled mid mid flight to. Uh, it's placed in orbit at uh, Lagrange point, point two, and here we are. Here we are. So that's what we have for James Webb Space Telescope. 